Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue. Welcome online and in person to Concordia University's Force Space. Thanks so much for joining us for Remembering Practice and Policy in Production and Distribution, a panel that reflects on cultural activism in media arts in Canada and UK, in the UK. I will let the moderator and panelists introduce themselves and contextualize this conversation a little bit more fully in a minute. But first, I just wanted to let you know that we are streaming to YouTube live from Force Space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands in Jojage, Montreal. And at Force Space, if you're new to this virtual space or in person, if you're joining us here live in the space, I just wanted to let you know what we do here. We work with our faculty, students, and staff in order to activate the ongoing research projects and various cross-cutting across the university initiatives uh, with the goal really of co-creating knowledge uh, and commu building community. And we do so by producing these daily hybrid events that are free and open to the public. So this week we are working with Elastic Spaces for Thinking Aloud, a project that brings together various branches of knowledge to address urgent issues around social justice and the environment. We're so glad to launch things with this first panel conversation. And I'll pa pass the floor to Leila Sujira now to get us started. Over to you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I'm just going to share a screen so that you can see. Um, can everybody see that? This is, um, and I'll, I'm going to do the intro to the panelists. So uh, this panel is, co is called Remembering Practice and Policy in production and distribution 30 to 40 years ago in the media arts in the UK and Canada. This panel looks back three to four decades in Canadian and British media art history within production workshops and festival presentations with Indigenous peoples and people of colour. For example, looking back at Canadian cultural activism then and now in the media arts, including the Invisible Colors Festival, the new initiatives in film for women of color and First Nation women. And um, I'm going to go now to the, um, the panelists. So um, Midi Onadera is a media artist and uh, Sylvia Hamilton, uh, a filmmaker, who are going to join me and one of the things we did was to bring up the archive of super women and i'll show you that archive afterwards but it's just down there it's on the cfmdc web page where uh where we are now and the web page is where the screenings will take place that are hybrid um, so the first part of the panel is Midi, me, and Sylvia talking about our experience in the 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, and early 90s. And um, I'm going to reference Midi's Superwomen conversations with the real action figures that she did in 2021 with a number of us. And then joining us from the UK are photo based artist Rashini Kempadu who's from Westminster University, an autograph member, and Sunil Gupta, University for the Creative Arts, and member of Autograph, OVA, and Innova. Uh, so starting right away, um, I'd like to take us to the Superwomen archives. And I'm showing you right now on the share screen, we're on the CFMDC TV uh, page. And uh, if I go to the Superwomen archives, and I picked out one of the um, panels with uh, Marjorie Bocage, who can't join us today because she's doing a water walk, a 1700 kilometer water walk. And I'm just going to play a few uh, up under a minute with Marjorie from 1991. And then I'll talk a little bit about my productions, then Midi, then Sylvia, then Rashini, and Sunil. Station with me. My pleasure. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about your initial attraction to making films? Like, was there a particular person or movie or something that inspired you? Oh. When I ran away from home at 40, 
and I went to film school. Uh, my attraction or reason was burnout and I needed to renew my spirit and find my own voice. Um, I had been facilitating everybody else's voice <laughs> and uh, through popular education and literacy and theater and different things. And I just got to the point where I had nothing left to give. So um, my coworker at the time, you know, I said, I need to get out of here. I need, to, I need a break. I need something. And uh, I had just gone to, for my 40th birthday to a women's writing retreat uh, in the desert in New Mexico and uh, on the Rio Grande. Uh, and uh, I, can't, I had just come back, and I knew then when I came back that I couldn't go back to work, like I needed more time. So then that's when my coworker suggested, you know, I go to film school and I said, what, are you crazy? You know, and I've, I got all these objections right away. And, and she said, uh, if you're, you're an adult educator, if, you're, if you were one of your students right now, what would you tell them? <laughs> anyway, when I, I, I was lying in bed that night, um, every time I thought about it, I got this big grin on my face. So I thought, well, I can't hurt to go check it out. Because I've always liked uh, movies and cinema and uh, wasn't exposed to it that much when I was younger, but I do, I was impacted by like this film called High Noon. And uh, I found out in film school that that was the first movie with a soundtrack, a musical soundtrack that was made. Anyway, uh, with a theme song. Yeah. Anyway, um, it, it had inspired me to stand, like about for justice. And, and even if you're just one voice, you can stand up, you know, type of thing that that was, and I didn't realize it was made in the McCarthy era and all of that. So later on, I, it, it had all these layers that had, I had somehow absorbed, you know, at 12 years old, <laughs> that uh, uh, impacted me in terms of uh, being, tell, telling those stories about injustice and just standing up for things. And I'm gonna stop Well, I mean, it and, um, we're going to go back and forth from the archives. So that was a dip into the archives with uh, Marjorie Bocage from 1991. And um, I'm going to start looking back at uh, the late 80s, early 90s. I would say, um, and this is to Rashini and, uh, and Sunil, and also to Sylvia and Mitty, for a lot of us in Canada, we were looking across at the kind of production you could do in the UK with Channel 4 and the, the co-productions that you had there. And um, I had just finished an installation called Working Portraits, which was um, a series of uh, large billboards, light boxes with uh, video monitors in front with uh, night cleaners. And I got an invitation to make a larger project on it. And I'd also written a short story called The Dreams of the Night Cleaners. So it came, became that project as a co-production with the BAMP Centre and the National Film Board of Canada. And they were looking at Channel 4 as a model. And I have to say that it was a wonderful beginning, but it was very, very complicated. Um, because the model wasn't, um, it had no guardrails, let's say. And when I ran into troubles in post-production, it was Midi Onadero who rescued me. And uh, I put a note to her in the credits. And she made sure that the project didn't go uh, unfinished, that I would somehow complete. So I'm just going to take us to the credits of that work. Um, I'm just going to share a screen again. Hold on. Making it was like my, my, uh, so I did everything on it myself so I could learn every aspect and 
it was uh, also Okay. This is a story about dreams and waking nightmares. This is a story about death. Perhaps an unremarkable death. It's a story about secrets. Family secrets, historical secrets. This is a story about Usha, who is working as a crew scheduler. As the threat of job loss comes closer, so do the shadows. Haunted by the images of her mother, lying in a pool of blood. Haunted by the shadow of her father, who died in a plane crash. So that work um, delved into family history and um, archival history. Um, I went into the archives of the Government of Canada, and um, it had all sorts of challenges. Um, when it was released, the National Film Board distri Distribution thought it did not um, present Canada favorably because I uh, looked at the race riots in the early 20th century, I looked at Prime Minister Mackenzie King's uh, white uh, policy, and uh, so it went to an independent distributor. So those were some of the challenges that we were facing in the early 1990s, and I completed that in 1995. Um, I'm going to stop there. I've got more clips to show, but I think um, it would be best to keep my presentation to 10 minutes. And so I'm going to ask Mitty to come into the conversation. And uh, we can return later to shared screen and clips, etc. Sunil also has a number of clips that I can show. Okay, over to Mitty. Thank you, Leela. Um, it's actually really great to see uh, a small clip of um, Night Cleaners again. It's been, it brings back a lot of memories. Um, uh, I, I guess, uh, have a fairly informal presentation, um, and I just want to start with, um, sort of labels that I have called myself or self-identified with over the years. So at first I was an experimental filmmaker, then I was an artist filmmaker, an independent filmmaker, and currently I view myself as a moving image artist. And I think that there's no question that these labels speak to the kind of work that I've done over the years. Uh, but of course, these labels are just um, immediate introductions to who we are. And, you know, like identifiers such as person of color, lesbian, feminist, they're all simple shorthand labels that don't really begin to explore the complexities of who we are and the kinds of work we do. I've been making films since I was in high school, but I count my professional activity um, at the point where I graduated from art college in 1983. So doing the math, and I can even do that in my head, uh, it's 40 years uh, that I've been making films. And uh, for this panel, I think the pivotal years for me, uh, like Leela, were the mid 1980s to the mid 1990s. Um, at that time, I was a young experimental filmmaker grappling with the sort of male dominated field of structuralist filmmaking and discovering really the more narrative implied work of Chantelle Ackerman and Chris Marker. I was also struggling with the limitations of the second wave of feminism and being exposed for the first time to this concept of person of color. 
And I'm sure it sounds really strange in today's land, landscape, but as a young 20 something, um, I did not view myself as at all as political. I really thought of myself as this apolitical artist. And as my parents instilled in me, I viewed my ethnicity as a detriment uh, since this is why as Japanese Canadians, they were interned during World War II. I was also exploring my sexual identity and this too was problematic as the dominant voices of lesbian, the lesbian feminist movement were all white women who in my opinion seemed to love folk music at hippie inspired events. And I was more attracted to punk and I remember actually cringing at my first invitation to participate in a women's film festival. Uh, for me, the process of politic politicization was really slow. And at first I saw this as a means of fundraising uh, as various government agencies suddenly popped up to address this idea of multiculturalism. Um, but when I started to work on the Displaced View in 1986, I discovered through this process that my identity was perceived as political. Around this time, the Japanese Canadian communities were mobilizing uh, around redress for the internment. And I had submitted a funding request to the Secretary of State Multiculturalism to make an experimental documentary on three generations of Japanese Canadian women. And I felt like this was a perfect fit for the government agenda. But of course, I was wrong. A representative of the Secretary of State Multiculturalism told me flat out that I would not receive any funding because the Japanese Canadian community was fighting for redress and any support of my film would be perceived as political and would signal support for the community's redress actions. This was a turning point for me personally and forced me to wake up about um, wake up to how my body and my very being was used as a political pawn. This gives you some bit of context for my thinking at the time. Um, I would say that my artwork and my political awareness were gradually emerging, but I would also say that I did not go quietly or fully embrace everything that was promoted at that time. Looking back, I think it's easy to generalize. It's easy to talk about Canadian history and independent filmmaking in broad terms that unify us rather than delve into the complexities that separate us. We want a history to, to def, sort of def, def, definitively tell us what happened, but we also simultaneously know that this is not true. Being involved in this panel and also working on the Superwomen Conversations with Real Action Figures project, back in 2001, forced me to look back at this period of time and think about where we were and where we are today. When I was working on the Superwomen project, it made me consider who was still around, who was still making films. There are, many, there are some women who made first strong, first and, uh, first and second films, but for every, whatever reason, they changed media or gave up filmmaking altogether. Um, so this made me think about whose voices are heard and whose are not heard. And I would also say that this is like a period of time that is largely undocumented. Um, most of the people working in the mid 80s are still alive and many are still making work today. So our perspectives of this time are also changing as we age and, more, and the more time separates us from our youth. So as Leela suggested earlier on, I would love to encourage you to watch some of the Superwomen series, uh, which is available on CFMDC TV. Uh, as Leela pointed out, um, there are seven women artists who were making work at that time. Uh, I would point out Marie Theresa Loren, who following the panel today, uh, we'll be screening her film Shadow Girl, and I'll be leading a Q&A on that. And also Michelle Mohabir's film Queer Coolitudes, which will be screened on Wednesday following the panel at noon. So I'm very excited about this afternoon's discussion. I, know, I would also say that, again, this is not a complete history. It's a mere drop in the bucket of a larger 
picture of filmmaking in Canada and the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, over to Sylvia. Thank you, Leila, and good day, good afternoon, everyone from Mi'kmaq, Nova Scotia. Who holds the camera? Who holds the microphone? Who controls the tools of production? I'll speak briefly about how I grew up because that grounding laid the foundation for the change work that I came to do. I was nurtured in a community that believed in fundamental human rights, a belief instilled in me. I was taught to advocate for those who might not be able to do so themselves. If you can force a door open, hold it open so others may come through. I witnessed community activism firsthand, my mother and other parents going to school board meetings, advocating for education, women and men using the black church as a base to organize housing cooperatives, adult education programs in the community and beyond. As an individual, you can and should act. Collectively, you can do more. One of the core beliefs that fortifies my work is the philosophy of collective action and collective responsibility. In the early 1970s, I worked in Ottawa with the Company of Young Canadians. It was a national agency that supported young people throughout Canada to work as volunteers in their communities. This period was ripe with citizen and community activism housing cooperatives, the first rape crisis center in Vancouver, tenant organizing, indigenous community organizing. Working there informed my later work, what an education it was. A second core belief is that public institutions funded by tax dollars should be available to everyone, not just a selected few. Agencies or institutions receiving public funding should not operate as if they were private bank accounts. These values, that is collective action and responsibility and full access to public institutions underpinned my approach in any work I did with CBC, the NFB and the Canada Council for the Arts. For decades, I worked on two fronts, creating my own work and simultaneously generating opportunities for other women creators, and especially for women of color, indigenous women, and women marginalized by society's rigid structures. I might pause to add that the term women of color, people of color, it's something that we've used in Nova Scotia since the 1800s. So it's not a new term at all. It's one that, that we've had in this province since my ancestors came here. 1995 was International Women's Year, a year of hope and loud radical feminist voices, energy, and uppity women uniting. I had a gold and yellow t-shirt printed with the phrase uppity women unite. Black people and black women in particular were accused both directly and indirectly of being too uppity. I wore it proudly. My involvement in, in visual media making began in the late seventies with the real life film and video collective. This women's group was committed to using the relatively new porta pad video technology to document women's lives and experiences. We recorded a variety of interviews, community events, and one of the first human rights sex discrimination boards of inquiry in Nova Scotia. I also became involved in organizing and producing community cable television programs about Black community affairs and the work of women's groups. 
the ad hoc women in film group of the early 1980s was a loose collective of women who were keen to shoot films by and about women on 16 millimeter film. My film, Black Mother, Black Daughter, was supported by this group. Produced by Sheila McKenzie at the NFB, I co-directed it with Claire Prieto from Toronto. Released in 1989, it was the first film out of the NFB's Atlantic Center, directed and produced with an all-female crew. We premiered the film in Halifax to about 1,000 people in two screenings and about 500 more or so in Toronto. My friend and colleague, the late St. Clair Bourne, Black documentarian and producer said, quote, everyone should have the right and opportunity to see themselves reflected in the cultural expressions of the land in which they live. For this to happen though, creators need outlets, need the tools of production, need access, distribution. And therein my motivation for the change work that I began at the NFB Studio D in Montreal. Set up in, in 1974, the studio was unique in the world. It was a hub for women's production, but its films rarely represented the full spectrum of women. Who was holding the camera? The microphone. Studio D was populated primarily by white women. They were the producers and directors leaving little space for independence to create work at the studio. I began work there in the fall of 1989. By the spring of 1990, with input from executive producer Rena Fraticelli, I had written the framework document outlining the new initiatives and film program known as NIF. In brief, five-year program had three components, a resource skill bank listing women of color and, and indigenous women, an internship at the NFB in Montreal, and a summer training institute. We later expanded to include a video camera loan program where we shipped high eight video cameras from one end of the country to the other to women who had no access to cameras. Using a peer jury, we awarded small startup grants to kickstart projects. An external advisory board drawn from the constituent communities of the creators was set up to advise and guide the program. Nothing like this advisory board existed at the NFB. I built this concept into the framework document as a point of accountability for NIF. And NIF was not without its problems and detractors, but women of color and indigenous women did benefit from the program during its short lifespan. One specific institutional change resulted NFB created three full-time special mandate producers who were charged with working with independent filmmakers of color and indigenous filmmakers across Canada. In the mid 1990s, I joined the second racial equity committee at the Canada Council for the Arts. We advocated for racial equity to become one of the council's overarching principles. We expanded our committee's mandate to include specific concerns focused on race, gender, art practice, culture, and differently able artists, rather than that catch-all, cultural diversity. We were a serious crew, from program guidelines to the composition of juries, to the council's strategic plans, to staffing, staff development, we critiqued it all. We insisted that we present our final report in person to the council's board of directors. This would be no ordinary presentation. We used music. Hugo Torres from Winnipeg brought his guitar and poetic narratives to present our recommendations. This had never happened before a Canada Council board meeting. Subsequent racial equity advisory committees built upon and advanced our work. As chair of the Women in Media Foundation in the mid-1990s, I led the development of new opportunities for girls and women and ensured our mandate would in include 
a focus on the needs of women of color, indigenous women, and differently abled women. We ran summer training camps for girls across the country. We put cameras into their hands, gave financial support to new college graduates from radio and TV programs to find their first jobs, provided grants to women to develop, to upgrade their skills or research their ideas. Transformative change is a continuous process that requires constant diligence, advocacy, collective action. All of us can play a part in creating the conditions where everyone would be free to create art, direct their own lives, and build a future for next generations. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And I look, yeah. I, I look forward to coming back in the conversation uh, with Mitty and you and me talking about the new initiatives in film. They were very exciting years, as well as the Canada Council um, work that you've been doing. Uh, and now over to Rashini. Uh, we'd Hi love there. To hear. Okay, thank you so much, um, Marina, for the invitation and to Ele Elastic Spaces as a project. Um, I'm going to share the screen and to show you some of the images that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, and also, I'm probably going to overlap with um, Sunil's work as well, um, because we've been working over on this side of the Atlantic for some time. I'm going to start so that I keep to 10 minutes, which I think is important as well. Um, so I just wanted to make two points in the 10 minutes that I'm, I'm showing you my work. Um, and that's to do with both on, on the one hand, the idea of, and I think people have spoken about this, the critical engagement with photography as a creative move, uh, medium. Um, and we heard from Midori and, um, and Leela and uh, Sylvia around film. I, work, I worked as a photo artist um, and came from a, a documentary photography tradition. Um, and in the 80s and, and, and 90s, I was working with what I would describe as a constructed image um, for exhibition, as well as working in the documentary form uh, as well. Uh, for a picture agency. So since then, I think one of the things that's quite important to think about is to think about the history in the present moment. And I always enjoy doing that uh, as a whole often reminds us to do. Um, so uh, these are just two images taken from um, a kind of uh, material from the, the show that um, Sunil actually curated um, of, a, of my work of some 75 pieces um, during 2004. Um, and that was on tour. Um, and so I'm going to start with thinking a little bit about the, uh, the idea of um, both the critical engagement, but also the period associated with an exploration of, a, of aesthetics and the concepts that challenge the conventions of photography. And I think that's really important for us to think. So it's these two, two issues that I think actually characterizes the eight, late 80s, um, early 90s for us in photography and film. Um, in the UK. So autograph, of course, you would see, you could see some um, more uh, current images. You can see these are, are things that are coming up, exhibitions that are coming up, um, very much around um, single, but also exploring other, um, other group shows as well. And really, we, um, because we're talking about a kind of a historical moment, um, I think I wanted to draw attention to us as Sarah Ahmed and others referred to as the laboring body, as you know, change makers or cultural activists, as well as visual artists that do the work in order to bring about change. And I call this activism, which was led by Asian, Arab, African and Caribbean groups. And of course, in, in the UK, um, you may be familiar with the term the political black or the black that actually encompassed these particular um, different groups. And it was a critical response in relation to the presence in Britain, its portrayal as associated with social unrest and the basis of political anxiety. And I think that's a really important issue to think about the, to the moments of, of our production and our activism um, in the, in the, set within a kind of a more historical moment, if you like. 
Um, and so this, for example, you can see is a, a piece by Stuart Hall for the, the auto portraits show. Um, and the agency has been an unrelenting um, in the level of activity and sheer work it has done to position the work of black photographers. And I'm using the term um, in that sense. It was created from the need for space to debate, learn, create, struggle, let our angst and frustration and anger out about a system that was systematically ignoring us. We had to learn to organize ourselves to be responsive. This was not easy. And people involved, of course, as wrote to me, Fanny Keo, David A. Bailey, Sunil, um, who's going to speak later, Monica Baker, Amit Faraz, to name a few. So these series are taken from um, my identity in production, the series of auto um, for the auto portraits show, which was a significant show uh, that we um, that autograph did the first one. Um, and I guess it was it was marked by a period of identity politics and identifying ourselves. So that kind of 80s was really bound by that notion of exploring a relationship to Britishness. Um, and my own work, of course, was pre-digital at that time, exploring a stage stylized form of representation, looking directly into the camera manipulation in the dark room, adding text, for example. We also were very interested in autograph, always worked with, worked with on an international basis. And I think this is important to recognize the, the kind of network and connections that were associated with it. So um, with Drick in Bangladesh here, for example, um, and equally so uh, working with archives. So the idea of how we think about um, archive um, and the, the, the presence of, of blackness in history. Um, so these images uh, were part of the black market show and they're also going to be, um, they're involved in being in this, um, in this work that's coming up, um, that's being um, curated by the Tate Britain around women in revolt. Oops, sorry, I don't know why this is happening. Yeah. Um, yes, and you can see there's three here. So I just wanted to um, think a little bit about, you know, the way in which um, the idea of how we were challenging the aesthetic really, which I think was really quite key. Um, and I think Stuart Hall and David A. Bailey in, um, in Critical Decades of 10.8 actually uh, encapsulated this and I'll just read it out. The history of black photographic image making has been obsessed with opening up the apparently fixed meaning of images where documentary photography carries a claim to truth with the meta message of this is how it really was. A number of black photographers began to explore questions of identification, the issue of how best to contest dominant regimes of representation. This mode goes against the grain of realism. Indeed, it opens up realism and it exposes it as a particular genre and privileges instead, which can be grouped together under the rubric of avant-gardeism. Oh man, why isn't this? moving, sorry, click on it, yeah. So these are just, um, moving on, I just wanted to kind of bring you, uh, one of the things that I was personally connected to was also 10.8, where I work, it worked, and I think 10.8 was a really significant as a publishing um, magazine around photography that actually really um, uh, brought home and brought some of these debates to the fore, and you can see and get an idea of Stuart's um, involvement in it, but also many others. And I think it was really important to also think a little bit about the way in which, um, you know, it kind of captured the debate of the moment about identi identity uh, making um, and, and really uh, provided a platform for people to contribute to, to actually uh, look at the way in which the, the black image was being, the black figure was being visualized. You can see some of the people who were involved in 10.8 here, um, and some of the terms that were actually being used at that time, which I think have really moved on, of course, but, the, um, but it's just interesting to see how that word all kind of captures the range of what 
we were discussing and exploring conceptually in relation to 108. And then, of course, the, uh, the other area of work that was quite important was the publishing and the uh, and it was integral to supporting the Women's Photography Festival, Spectrum Women's Photography Festival. And you can see here that there were many people involved, including myself and Rhonda Wilson, Mumtaz Karimji, Pratiba Palmer, Joy Gregory, Maxine Walker, um, for example. And this was a, a catalog created around the festival, um, but it was important and it gave voice to uh, the work that was being done and also recognizing the central issue of how women were uh, identifying themselves in that sense. And it really also speaks to the way in which I was involved with the format Women's Picture Agency. Since my undergraduate education in, uh, from 1984 to 2003, I was involved with the Women's Picture Agency. It's a cooperative and the only ever women's picture agency with Maggie Murray, Brenda Prince, Raisa Page, Jenny Matthews, etc. And of course, they were really connected to um, the, the Green and Common movement. And this is just some of the kind of staged or portraiture that was associated with my work with format. Um, and this, for example, of Margaret Busby as Daughters of Africa uh, editor, and which has recently been repub uh, republished and reissued. Um, and some, some of you will sit and be familiar with um, the womanist show of the 1990s. So very much around the idea of centering my work on, um, on uh, the idea, oops, I'm sorry. Um, the idea, oh. I can't stop it. <laughs> okay, I, apologies. Um, yes, it was the, the way in which um, the, the notion of portraiture was quite, is quite in, uh, central to that process and to my contribution. And now, of course, we can see format at 40. This is currently on at um, Bishopsgate Institute. Um, uh, so the archiving of the work is being completed. Um, I'm going to stop there because I realized that what I'm one of the things I wanted to do if I had time was to think a little bit about how that kind of continues on in the present moment and really the kind of the response that some of us um, are continuing to have as the elastic spaces I think is is continuing to do is to bringing this kind of level of activism into the space of the here and now to support activists um, uh, and now and and to meet some of those challenges of the political and cultural space that we're working from. So I'd like to kind of see and frame that uh, the kind of work that I showed in relation to the work that I'm now doing, which is centrally around the way in which we think about history and memory in relation to the here and now and, and expressions of it, but also in relation to uh, uh, environmental activism and particularly the centralizing of women activists um, in relation to that. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. Thank you, Rashini. And uh, I look back forward to coming back to the creating interference slide that you, you uh, held in the conversation. So uh, over to Sunil, and uh, Sunil is going to talk about his work and his involvement with a number of different organizations, including Autograph, OVA, Innova, and possibly a few others. So over oh, to no, that's way too many, way too many. <clears throat> so pardon me, I've got a very weird uh, throat today, but so uh, let's, I'm going to do, oh yeah, do the sharing bit. Uh, sorry, it's opened up all kinds of windows for some reason. There we go. Uh, so basically, I just quickly say that an interesting setup today that we're in Concordia. It's the place I got my first degree. And the last speaker was Roshini Kempadu, who talked me into doing a PhD at Westminster. And the substance of that was that 
I reconsidered my migration story as one of departure from a homeland to an arrival uh, and what that meant. Arriving in Montreal gave me a whole other identity. Anyway, so I'll move on. That was in the 70s, though. So in the 80s, by the 80s, I'd come to England and doing an art degree. And I came out of uh, <clears throat> art school uh, into the, in the early 80s into a very postmodern, post-colonial world. So, uh, so for me, the politics was really about post-colonial. We were reading Homi Baba and Gayatri Spivak and stuff like that. So race we saw in those terms. Uh, so this is the, one of the first shows I was involved with. Okay, Switchboard was a project I did for myself. Uh, and so really I wanted to be a kind of uh, campaigning type of documentary photographer, a little bit like Roshni, I suppose. Uh, and so India though was one of my subjects. So I very much was going back and forth and trying to keep that connection going. Uh, but in London, I turned to the GLC, our town hall. They were very keen on me. I had a very short, definitely ethnic sounding name. You know, my name wasn't Joy Gregory. You couldn't confuse me with a white person. Uh, and so here's a little poster for the kind of thing I thought I wanted to do, but which kind of got very derailed. And so one of the other very important books of the time was this burden of representation. So as practitioners of color, uh, we kind of then suddenly have to fill these very big shoes that everything you say, everything you do, every picture you make has to somehow very correctly represent your race. And that's, that's a very complicated, but potentially even a trap to fall into. So that's a discussion maybe worth having. It's a never ending kind of discussion I find. Here's a, an image of something that Roshni also showed again is to do with our town hall. So we got involved with policy making. So that was the key thing. Uh, a number of people like Sonia Boyce and myself also, we turned our backs to commercial art world of Cork Street and selling, you know, getting a gallery, selling your work. Instead, we came to the town hall to work around public policy and the arts. I joined things like this K Black group. You can see from the definition of black, it actually included a whole range of races. And then I did stories like this for a living. My living was to work for the media. Uh, interesting story, I pulled it out for today because it's about black Tories. This is a very contemporary phenomenon, although that's the 80s in fact, but today uh, the British Tory party has been much more successful at producing a front bench of black and Asian people compared to the Labour Party. But that's yet another question for discussion later. So by the mid eighties, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, cultural activism going on. We defined ourselves more as cultural activists rather than artists or photographers. And we had a number of places like camera work in London where we could convene. Camera work was a dark room and a gallery and a publication. This was an early LGBT show. Very crucially, as you can see, the second list is called workshop. Workshop was, uh, secondary school students who came to do workshops with us. <clears throat> I kept going to India to explore uh, what homosexuality might mean there. It was obviously at the time a very taboo subject. Uh, so this was a body of work that I managed to then finally make, you know, having by now dropped the documentary approach because that had become so discredited and so ethically in question, you know, so I ended up having to make this body of work uh, as a kind of very directed mise-en-scene, setting it up, getting actors, etc. Uh, and then a lot of the later part of the 80s for me was spent involved in uh, arts funding and in town hall funding and sitting on various committees, writing reports. And this is what we seem to be spending a lot of time on. And I think in, uh, I think, Leela, when you wrote something about policy making, this was literally what we were doing. And I think this is what brought me into some contact with people from Toronto who came to London to look for these very policy uh, studies. So autograph could not have happened had this policy report not been commissioned. 
researched and written before any money could be given. Then, of course, the 80s was also a big AIDS moment. Uh, there's 10-8, Roshni has talked about that. But there were a number of very important publications around film and photography that <clears throat> were pretty much uh, where we would find our theory and our politics and where you could write and read and try out things. And this issue of exposure, Simon Watney and I made a photographic <clears throat> research on the rhetoric of AIDS, for example. Screen was a film magazine, but also had space for some interesting theory that was relevant to us. Uh, several important books were coming out by independent practitioners, writing the image by Eve Lomax, you know, shifting the focus, maybe away from the lens, more towards the pen, you know, trying to talk about the image. Conferences took place like this, changing identity, very important ones about race and representation and who you are. Uh, this, I believe, has become a book over time. And then exhibitions happened. This one on the left, one India, I think it's the earliest one that I know of in London, which was focused on Indian photography from India. And then on the right is a much smaller exhibition that took place in London uh, with photography by people of, that used to be called Asian, yeah, but I think they mean South Asian living in the UK. Uh, David A. Bailey, who Roshan has mentioned, organized this exhibition called DMAX, where there was the beginnings of a kind of schism because suddenly here, black is now becoming skin color. These are people of African descent basically only. And so there's a, a different kind of beginning of a debate sort of starting here. Uh, I meanwhile went the other way. I thought, okay, I'm going to focus on South Asians. And so Fable Territories was a job I took on for a gallery. Uh, this was a survey show again of South Asian artists in this country. Uh, oh yeah, Fable Territories had Roshini, we just saw that already. <clears throat> There's more Fable Territories. Uh, it was hard to get South Asian audiences. So one of the policy problems we had was that find there are practitioners and we're here today, some of us talking, but it's really hard to get <clears throat> our people to the exhibitions. <clears throat> South Asians in the UK anyway, are loath to go to an art exhibition. They just don't go. So we had to bribe them with food and Bollywood music, anything else to get them in. Now this exhibition had a curious history in Canada. It traveled to Vancouver, to the Vancouver Art Gallery. And there was a demo, by the time I got there, there was a demonstration outside. And uh, Canadian artists in Vancouver of color uh, were arguing that the bag was fulfilling its racial quota. Assume it seems like it did have some kind of quota uh, with imported artists of color from the UK. Meanwhile, completely ignoring the local artists of color right there at their doorstep in Vancouver. It was people like Chris Creighton Kelly and Zainab Bergi and all that. Uh, uh, so meanwhile, in London, shows were happening around specifically Black subjects. Testimony was three Black women organized by Lubaina Hamid. Uh, it was a queer show, but it was produced at a time in the 80s when Black people and queerness really did not fit together. So it really couldn't be said out loud. Reflections of the Black Experience was the show in 86 that took place in Brixton that brought a number of Black photographers together, which led to a series of meetings that kind of led to autograph. This was some of my pictures from that show. I had 10, everybody had 10 pictures. I made 10 categories of South Asian life in this country. Uh, two years later, this small group of people remained after many people had joined and left and joined and all of that. This is the people who signed off Autograph as a company. Uh, so Autograph was launched uh, very ambitiously. We wanted to have exhibitions, publications, and everything basically that photography normally had. And of course, that was the first exhibition. 
Um, so other things happened, you know, in the 80s, Clause 28, the whole AIDS thing, plus the very homophobic British government that we were living with. For me, that's always been a, uh, a really terrible situation. I came here from North America from a relatively lib more liberal understanding of what it meant to be a gay man to a country where there was actual persecution and active persecution. Uh, so I made work about that at the end of the 80s. And we made work about uh, AIDS. This is what ecstatic antibodies is. We realized that exhibitions without publications could, didn't have the reach possibly. So we explored books. Uh, so I just got into, fell into curating. But as other people have said already, you know, us uh, artists of color were not getting any cues of curators knocking at our door, really. So you kind of had to do it yourself if you were going to get shown. Uh, so in the 90s, uh, uh, it never was started. That's a whole other big story. But basically, Arts Council funded a visual arts organization to look after uh, uh, everybody of color. And um, three years prior to that, they gave out some franchises, two curating ones went to Eddie Chambers and myself. I started over as a curating company. And so suddenly I went from shooting pictures for a living to organizing art exhibitions for a living. Uh, <clears throat> that Disrupted Borders came to Canada. There it is at CMCP. Uh, I brought Joy Gregory to help me put it up. She said, it's minus 35 outside, I'm not going out. You'll have to do it alone. <laughs> then queer studies came along, black queer studies came along, and so on. Uh, but I think I've run out of time. I'll just show you the pictures. Uh, this is an Australian connection. So similar identity politics also now happening in Australia uh, and in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, Trophies of Empire was a show organized around the Columbus centenary. Uh, it's my contribution to it. It traveled to Vancouver, then on to the Havana Biennial. And then uh, I made some work about home, uh, India, Canada in this case, New York, London in this case, like that. Uh, I periodic, I was coming back all the time. My parents still lived in Montreal. Uh, and so I moved to India basically. And then there, from there, I made some work uh, and a lot of things happened. So I think I'm going to, uh, yeah. I'll just end it here. I'm sorry, I want to slightly over, but uh, one of my last over shows was Joy Gregory. In fact, uh, it was Roshini Kempadu and Joy Gregory were my last curated projects. Uh, and uh, on the right is the front cover. It's a potential front cover of a book that I'm just working on. Uh, what I wanted to talk about what's happening now is that I have a huge archive and I've discovered a way of getting bits of it published. So all the projects are finally seeing the light of day because a publisher is interested in publishing them. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. So we have time for discussion. Thanks very much everyone for uh, bearing with me. Thank you, Leela. So thank you, Sunil, and thank you everyone. Um, I'm just, I've got a couple of directions we can go. One is the future present and the past. So I'm just going to um, outline some of my questions and then we can all jump in. So the new initiatives in film that Sylvia, you really outlined um, 
very effectively. And it's an institution that Mitty and I were also able to participate in, and uh, we would both agree that it's important. Um, and we, we were thinking of that as a kind of fierce time. It, it was a difficult time. And uh, the British critic Kabina Mercer talked about the, um, the hierarchies of oppression and how that plays out in, uh, in a sense, not allowing us to shape communities. And Roshini, your suggestion about creating interference in an archive and your event coming up next week, I'd, I'd really like to hear about that and how elastic spaces can come together and follow up on these conversations in a publication and further research. Um, so those are some of the questions. And um, from Sunil and Rashini, conversations that the two of you would have about that time period, those are all of the um, aspects that I hope we could touch on. And as well from our audience here uh, in person and our audience in the, um, in the Zoom. If you want to put questions in chat, um, and I can read them out, or if you want to bring up questions from the floor, uh, just uh, put your hand up and uh, we can take the, the mic to you. So um, what about Rashini, if you talk about uh, your event on creating on interference with the archive and how that might help us as a methodology in order to go forward talking about these histories, these lived histories that are appearing through exhibitions. Um, we were talking about the 40 year mark as being a kind of significant marker where exhibitions start to get organized and publishing that comes in as a result. So over to you, Rashini. Thank you. Thank you, Leela. Um, I guess, let, let me just share the screen and show you the, um, the, the blogs um, that we have, and then also the information about the speculative approach to the archive. So I guess one of the things that we've been doing is to think through, well, just following, you know, lots of people there are a lot of artists, visual artists working with history, and we all are kind of revisiting our own histories, but we're also very interested in, um, in, in bringing criticism to the types of historical material and historical narratives that are actually to be found in the museums, galleries, institutions, etc. And of course, part of that process is the, the, the critique of it, is the idea of how um, what kinds of narratives that are being are being brought. So what we're trying to do here is to think through the way in which, I guess it's getting artists to do more work, right? <laughs> so artists on the one hand have been critiquing and making interventions as we all have, and, and, and much of our work here was, um, was demonstrating that, um, of where you're, you're really in making interventions of a conceptual kind in the work itself, in the material itself. But equally so, we can draw on the 80s and 90s um, for the kind of cultural activism or change-making process that I think artists also had to perform at that point in time. So one of the things that we're trying to ask people to do is to think through what it would, what it would mean to imagine a different kind of archive, right? What would, what would you, what would you, you expect to be collected? What, what, kind of indices and categories would you would an artist kind of ideally think about right so it's actually asking artists to think beyond their own practice and to think about what it means to intervene into the institutions and how do we imagine imagine something different and that's not to say that that work is not being done that you know people are creating different monuments that are temporary they're performing in the in the institution but equally so we still have those very large uh, collections that are also driving the agendas and often i mean if we think about stuart hall's work 
he often kind of brings a critical engagement to history, the making and the, the support of history at particular moments, which actually bring a more regressive and retrospective kind of space to our, our, our here and now. So I guess that's what we're actually trying to think about. Um, and, we, and I'm working with uh, Lola Olofemu, who is thinking about what, how to imagine something different. So what do we imagine in the future as artists, as makers, as change makers uh, for a different kind of archive? And that's not to say that the counter archives that we often know about and we are working from are not really, really significant. So Sunil's work, your own work, you know, this, these kinds of smaller materials that are in collections, but these are not the things that are pushing hegemonic kind of um, uh, institutions forward, right? These are the kind of the counter poetics that we have in our society. And so I guess in a way, I'm just trying to prompt more of a discussion about it and more of an intervention around it. Does that kind of answer your question? And of course, it would be great to hear what other people think about, about that and, and other ideas that you might have and thoughts. Yeah, I, I'm curious to hear from Mitty and Sylvia and uh, Sunil on this. And I'm, I like the phrase, what it would mean to imagine a different kind of archive. And I'm wondering if it could be an exhibition, you know, a kind of, um, the series title we have is Thinking Aloud, you know, the sense of how to think about things and what, what that means. So over to Midi, Sylvia, Sunil. It's Sylvia. I'm. I'm. Uh, thank you for the my colleagues on this panel for the presentations and, uh, you know, the the last piece, uh, Rashini, about archives. I think a lot about the archives. I've used the archives in my film work and also in um, this ongoing installation project called Excavation, which I've been doing for probably six or eight years, where I've actually gone into different um, galleries and museums and used material from their archives, match with material from my own personal archives. And one of the questions I think I often ask is, who defines what an archive is? Right? Like, how do we define it? And the fact that you know, some of the things that we might see at the community level, uh, different objects uh, may not be considered archival by the formal institutions, but they do have meaning for the various communities out of which that material or those objects may come. So I think when we um, are accepting this challenge of how do we imagine differently, what is, you know, what do we think about archiving in the future? I think we perhaps need to think about how do we define what are our definitions of, of archives and you know who who do we who do we trust in terms of of that whole collection process and how do we ensure that um, the many many communities across the world who are doing amazing work I think about the women in different communities who are making um, you know, their crafts and the things that they do every day, uh, would that not be worthy of, of finding a way to, uh, to archive it? So, so in sum, it's, it's really thinking about, you know, how we define that term and then how do we, how do we think broadly with it? Uh. So, Leila, if I could just uh, have a little brief response. Uh, for me, there was the difference between the collecting institutions, and in our history, that would mean the museums like the Tate or the VNA and all of that, who for a very long time were not interested in our work. We were equally not interested in giving it to them or engaging with them, really. And I think that we had an idea, and I think I still have this idea, that as little archive people, us and you and me, uh, we're a kind of living archive. 
and we make our work to kind of add to it. And, uh, and it's precisely not with that intention to create an overarching hegemonic cultural history that, hey, South Asians in Canada and the UK are like that. Obviously they're not, you know, because it's about you and me as individuals. And so I think that's been part of it. Uh, uh, looking at this process, I'm a little surprised at how many there's this current interest in excavating our work and the institution that Roshni will back me up are knocking at our doors wanting to acquire it, especially from the 80s. And they want to put it into their museum collections and their archives. You know, way back in the 70s, my earliest photo teacher was Lisette Modell. And she said to me, darling, when your work is dead, it'll be in a museum. And I've never forgotten that. That's, that's it, you know, I, I feel like, yeah, you give it to them and you become some footnote in their giant narrative, yeah. Do you, do you mind, if, Lila, if I just share a quotation from Cabena Mercer, yeah. which I thought was quite an interesting one. Um, it, he, um, it's again, kind of something that I picked up on. Um, and he really makes a critique of the period of collecting. And I think Sunil's just referred to it, this idea of why we're actually in demand now of the eighties, right? Um, so yeah. here he says, diaspora didn't happen in a day, reflections on aesthetics and time in Kabina Mercer. And he wrote this in 2007. And he says the diminishing significance of community in discourse on identity that could be described as the gradual loss of aura surrounding the political definition of blackness as a signifier of radical difference. I mean, and then he quotes Amna Malik stated that essentially we live in a global economy that has become adept at mining ethnicity as a marketing tool to transform us into genuine citizens, i.e. consumers eradicating this difference as a site of resistance. And I think there's something quite there's something quite difficult to balance here, it seems to me, around the idea of the institution like the Tate or others that are absolutely interested in the corrective, right? <laughs> and that actually, you know, the idea of inclusion is going to be enough. And I guess in a way, it, it actually leads from, in my view, it also contributes very much to this idea of us being uh, 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 diffusing the site, the, the, the notion of blackness as a site of resistance, right? Which is where our work and activity has come from. And I think all of us around the room, in the room here, have been uh, showing that, right? So there's something quite interesting about being inside and being outside that we need to kind of worry away at. Um, and so the living archive that Stuart Hall talks about, the little archive is really an important kind of moment, but I, but I wonder about how that actually makes the sufficient intervention, sufficient intervention to what the mainstream process is going on, which is about inclusivity, right? How do we actually still maintain autonomy, independence and critique, right? How can you critique when you're actually inside being collected? <laughs> does, does that silence us? Yeah, yeah Roshini, I, I really think in the UK, you know, we have this contradiction where uh, our colleagues from the 80s are so inside the system, they accept prizes, yeah. they accept MBAs. MBEs, <laughs> they accept, you know, like the system hasn't changed one iota. No. And people have just been co-opted. I mean, don't they see that? I mean, I don't know what's happening. I mean, so the, the little, we were really about inclusion in a very broad general sense. And autograph itself was transformed as we know, but autograph it started as you know, Roshni, we were, we were uh, a collective. It was oh. a one person, one vote collective. You put your oh. hand up if you wanted oh. to. Oh. And everywhere you look now, that's not the case. There's all kinds of 
levels of exclusion and choices and price feelings and all of that. Uh, okay, Maybe. sorry, that's it. No, no, Nidhi, can we bring you back into the conversation? I was thinking of your Superwoman uh, series that, in a, in a sense for me, got that living history back into the conversation with your really um, careful and caring way of holding the conversations um, first with the artists themselves and then going through the edits and then a presentation of it. I, I found it really, really interesting and it was a kind of archive that had a, it, I think it, it did what we're trying to talk about where it's starting to put forward the, the community without it being prize oriented or exclusive. I, I find that these conversations are really uh, very rich and I can see that there's so many uh, commonalities between Canada and the UK in terms of this idea of uh, treating the past, the 80s, the 90s as some kind of jewel that now needs to be treasured by the institutions. And I, I find that really interesting. I think it's, it's happening here slowly on a very smaller scale. Uh, but my, my idea of superwomen was just the fact that uh, our stories were not being housed anywhere. We weren't, uh, there, was, there seemed to be a lack of discussion around the past. So it wasn't, it's not yet, and I expect that it probably will be in the next five to seven years be taken up more thoroughly by the Canadian institutions here. But I think that um, it's always important to constantly question uh, the past and throw wrenches into it, throw those uh, pieces of, of contradiction uh, because it's not, it's not easy, it's not simple. And doing the Superwomen series made me really reflect on the fact that there are no, a lot of voices that are not heard, even though you know, I, I chose <laughs> six other women to participate or seven. Um, there were many more that were not included. So I was completely aware of that idea, but I'm interested in this idea of um, what do we do? What does the next generation do with this information? How can you, how can the next generation build on our experiences and perhaps not reinvent the wheel? So I think that archives are important for those reasons because it's important to look back at our own histories and, and grow from there. So I think uh, Elastic Spaces is a very interesting place to sort of discuss that concept. Can I invite people in the audience to make questions or comments? Audience online, audience in person. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, thank you everyone for your wonderful presentations. I really, really uh, enjoyed them and found them interesting. I have a, a question, uh, it's tied to this idea of archives and history. Did you feel that your work, your artwork, your activisms in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, did you feel like you were making history at the time? Or is it only in retrospect that you feel like, wow, you know, this is something that we did and we had a historical impact? Thank you. No, I totally felt we were making history. That was the point of doing it. I came to it for the purpose of making that history. The very first pictures I took publicly were, were for uh, Kay McGill had a newspaper when I was an undergraduate in the early 70s. Uh, it was called Gazette, and uh, you can find it in the Montreal Lesbian and Gay Archives. And you'll find in there pictures by me of demonstrations, saunas burnt down, cruising on St. Catherine. And I was doing it 
to catch that moment for us because nobody else was. It wasn't on TV. It was never going to be in the mainstream. You had to do it yourself. And not only that, but we also made the paper and we printed it. So there's actually hard copy evidence that it happened and show it for a... Uh, and so from there, I think I've been very self-conscious of doing that exactly. So uh, work that I feel like Roshni did and I did, I'm not wanting to speak for her, but we, I think, was underscored by a sense of a historical moment and that if we didn't put it out there, it wasn't going to uh, get said or get noticed or get recorded. Uh, you know, because I wasn't making work to sell. So I, I, it wasn't commercial. It wasn't for a magazine. Uh, uh, it wasn't a hobby, you know, I was doing it for the serious purpose of making an archive. And so was the curating, was about making more archives, a wider, that then you work with other people and other practices. For, for me, John, it was about the present, looking back at cultural history, social history, family history. And um, I was inspired by the work coming out of the UK and the kind of institutions that they had. And um, in, in the present moment, we had huge struggles just trying to make the work, and trying to complete it. That's why I was saying, you know, there were no guardrails, <laughs> no safety uh, guidelines when a project would go off rail because the institution would decide to do whatever they do, you know, a, a sharp turn. So it was important to have colleagues in a community that would um, keep our projects on track. Um, and, and the building of the community is difficult when there's uh, forces that are so divisive and not um, encouraging us to come together. It, it was really tough. and. One of the things that Mitty said to me about it was it, it was a fierce time, really fierce. And um, I'm curious uh, to hear from my colleagues about how they approach that. I, I don't know, shall I, shall I just, I mean, I, it's a really interesting question. I think definitely we were, um, as Sunil said, you know, we were actually knew we were making history. There's, there wasn't any question. Of it. But it, it's really was, was um, and so there, there's two things for me. One is that we were actually working also within a very specific context, right? We had Thatcher, we had, we had a difficult, a really, you know, Green and Common women were actually protesting. There was a moment where politically we were mobilized, right? So the context and the backdrop, the political and social backdrop required us to kind of see that. And, and for me, one of the things that's really important now is we're in that moment again, right? That we're in the moment of a crisis, of an existential, existential crisis that actually we, we have to mobilize in a very particular way. And I think that's one of the things, one of the reasons why I think it's quite important on the one hand, and I was interested with Midi's uh, uh, commentary about the importance and significance of collecting history from the eighties, because for me, there's, that's absolutely important. It's true, but how does a, a generation now with a completely different climate, different kind of context, a different mode of operating, how do they draw from that history of the 80s? And that for me is the biggest challenge, right? That it's not, it, ha it wasn't possible for us, it was possible for us to set up autograph at that particular moment in time because the Arts Council had some funding for us to be able to do that, right? But actually now, the public and private spaces, you know, the public spaces have shrunk. We have, you know, the economy is different for most people functioning. I'm not able to sell my, 
photography in the same way that I did with format, right? With the format women's picture agency. That's why it actually uh, stopped uh, operating in 2003 because the digital sphere came into, into being and people could not make their living in the same way. So when I hear my heart breaks, when I hear a photographer studying, doing an MA in photography and saying that they make one pound 50 um, digital, for their digital image, you know, this is not an economy that we are familiar with. And it's one that for me, I think one of the things that is quite nice about Elastic Spaces and other research networks is the possibility of being able to speak and listen to what young people are going through at this moment in time and how differently configured the backdrop and the context that they're coming from and how you know, some of those lessons, some of the lessons from the 80s can come forward, but not all of them. They're not necessarily applicable to our here and now in, in the slightest case in, in many, many ways. So it's a kind of an interesting balancing act that I think produces tension between an older generation and a younger generation. But I think, you know, as long as we can kind of maintain a respectful kind of space for those generational spaces and to have conversations like these, um, then we can get somewhere right? in terms of listening, but also uh, understanding that younger generations have to navigate their own space in, in this way, and we can help them do that. Well, I think uh, in London, we lost a lot of the spaces. All the independent sector went, and so there are no spaces. And it's true that what Roshni is saying, we could, one could live. I lived very, at a very low economic level. You know, you could sign on the door. We have the NHS. I got a council flat. You can't do that now. Obviously, you appreciate that. You know, uh, if you're young in London, you have to live virtually outside the city, you know. Uh, but having said that, I feel that in our time, it, it took its toll. Uh, I'm still here and Lila's still here and Roshni's still here and Sylvia is still here. Uh, but there are a number of people that we know who haven't made it, who are not with us and who went very quickly right there because it was a lot of pressure. Um, so I sometimes feel like uh, one of the things that's changed is that there is this revived interest in these archives and that time and the whys and wherefores that skipped a decade or two you know, like the, it felt in the 90s and early 2000s that uh, the YBAs led the way and Goldsmiths that, that an MBA, like, you know, an MFA was like an MBA. It was a, it was a ticket to make money. And people weren't interested in what all this was about. Uh, Mehdi, can I ask you to... Um, well, I think Sylvia had. Uh, yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Sorry, I was going to um, just pop in for a moment sure. to the question about did we all know we were making history? I think about the fact that when nothing exists and you create something that didn't exist before, then you are making history. And sometimes it's easy to forget that because then something is around and then you maybe just take for granted that it's there and, and you have to figure out ways that you're going to use it or not use it. But the fact that, you know, some all of the work, I mean, that we've been talking about didn't exist before. And so then it existed. Um, and then I think the, the biggest challenge I see is how do we find cooperative spaces where younger generation, we can sit with younger generations to talk about what we did and how we did it and they can take from it what we will and again going back to my own uh, upbringing that's what happened in my community in terms of of my my growing up you know we learned from the elders we there was a level of of point where we had to ask those kinds of essential questions but again you go out on your own but we we had those 
kind of communal spaces where there was multi-generational things happening, whereas now I'm just not so sure that, that that's the case. And if we want younger, the younger generation of creators to learn about what happened in the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, the 2000s, we have to figure out a way to create these, these common spaces where that intergenerational set of ideas and exchanges can happen. And, and I think that that to me is, is what's critical at this moment, because otherwise, and to remember, as Sunil was saying, those who, who went too early, like we can't forget them. We have to find those ways to keep naming those names so that they're not, uh, they're not forgotten or erased as if they didn't matter. So I think those are the two things that, that for me are really essential. How do we how do we make sure that we keep bringing those names forward and how do we find intergenerational spaces so that we can um, share the things that, that we experienced? Uh, I completely agree with uh, what Sylvia just said, but it really calls attention, I think, to me to the the idea of even communicating i mean we live in this world of zoom we're on zoom i have no idea how many people are live in montreal um and you know we it feels like we were, are relying on these kinds of spaces these uh digital spaces to have these kinds of conversations but a conversation is a two-way street you have to listen and you have to participate um, in Zoom situations like this, I find it hard to participate. So it's, I'm just, again, I look to, to the, the younger people in the audience to ask them, like, what is social media, for example, a good way of communicating? Are we, uh, am I just too old to understand that format enough to, to understand that that's a good platform to use to communicate? Or am I right in my thinking in that it's a poor way of communicating? I think it's, uh, it's up to us to be open to them also. Maybe, maybe we're a bit harsh about them. Um, I've had experience where I have taken the first step to join a younger group of people of act in activism or cultural stuff. Uh, both in India, where I still be saying it's non-Western, so it's more likely that there's intergenerational crowd. Uh, but also here, uh, and obviously then it sort of takes an effort, but I'm trying to maintain uh, contact wherever I can find them. And around me in London, let's say, in South London, there are pop-up spaces, uh, where these discussions happen. There are young artists who show something and create discussion days. And really it's up to you to go there and engage. Uh, or sometimes a small gallery will take an initiative around a topic. Uh, in my case, for example, it's been AIDS. It comes up every now and then. And this is the, exactly this discussion happens. There's a bunch of PhD student age people and then there's people like me who've lived through this pandemic and they want to know what happened, you know, uh, but they don't think about it in the same way. So it's kind of interesting. And I'm curious about what they think, exactly what Roshni is saying. But that's what I find them. That's the thing. Uh, what I've been finding also is that I was involved in an NGO archives project called Hall Carpenter in London, which was oral history with lesbians and gay men going back to the First World War. Then it disbanded as, as these things happen. So all the material and my photographs all ended up in the library at the London School of Economics. And they are buried. It can't be really accessed. They don't do anything with it. You know, like it may as well not exist. So I think the universities are playing a role because often archives physical and spaces physical can happen there and some resources can happen there, exactly as we're doing here. Uh, 
this is, uh, can you hear me? This is what I was thinking about too, was um, talking about audience. Sunil, you talked about how difficult it was to reach out to a particular audience and having to figure out ways to bribe an audience in where, oh, yeah. where, does, where does the archive go that you're going to reach the audience that you want to give access to? You're just touching on this and uh, reaching out to people. But when we're talking about archives, how, how do you make sure that your archives aren't buried or that they go to the appropriate sites? It's very complicated and uh... I'm going to be 70 this year, so I'm seriously thinking about archives and where should they go. Uh, the options are, uh, I met a broker, he said, I can sell your archive to an American university for a large sum of money, and then you never see it again. It's just gone to someone. Uh, or you, you might then be thought, no, 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 we want to have a British archive. <clears throat> around the medium, around sexuality, uh, multi-generation, a little bit involvement. So I began writing uh, academic research grants, HRC grants, actually, with uh, uh, very young academics, people who just got PhDs and got their first job uh, to uh, initiate research projects around the archive where certain existing ones say yours and mine row could be a, could be the you know the material to experiment with to kind of try and make a, a way in which others could then be added or something uh, uh, and then I hit a stumbling block HRC said you won't we can't give you money to research your own archive so end of that story so uh, uh so yes it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a difficult one uh, and whether they should be uh, communal or national or regional interests uh you know that would come into play uh I think Sunil, you bring up a, a good point in terms of, um, you know, if you if you have or, or carry different identities, such as being gay or lesbian or um, trans or Canadian. whatever it is, Canadian, <laughs> yeah. British, um, where do you put your your archives? It's supposed to be a holistic view of who you are. You know, it's it's like, do I want my work? in only a gay and lesbian context? Do I want my work in an academic context? What context is that? You know, it's, it's, it's very complicated. And of course, it's, um, it's a large part of it has to do with money. It has to do with the fact that a lot of these archives are underfunded. So just by merely putting your work into an archive does not necessarily mean it will be seen because it needs to be cataloged, it needs to be organized, it needs to be uh, contextualized. And if there are a skeleton staff at these archives, it's not going to happen unless you as the artist or the uh, contributor to the archives puts all of that extra effort into presenting it in a cohesive package. That's a tempting thought, you know, because so I've given my curating archives, which was the over 14 years, to Innova, uh, which I don't know if you know, but so Innova currently exists uh, as a library resource in, within the Chelsea College of Art. Uh, uh, so that's great. You know, they're housed there, they're accessible. If you're, you can actually make an appointment, uh, third parties can go and view them. What's not happening is that they're not being activated in any way. Uh, and so, uh, so I don't know, sh shall I make an app, do some, get off my chair and say, okay, I'm gonna come down and 
do the research and put it together in some shape or form uh, to make it slightly more public, uh, whether it's online or whether it's, yeah. Can I, I mean, one of the things I've been thinking about, it was a really interesting question that, um, I'm sorry, I didn't, don't know who asked it, but just somebody off the screen maybe. <laughs> Um, about because if you turn it on its head, it's a kind of an interesting one, right? So what we're seeing is the the institutions and and organisations and private companies are buying to their for their own agenda, right? Are collecting for their own agenda. So the so for me the question then becomes, um, who was your intended audience, and who do you think, who, you know, the question is, who wants to collect this work, right, as well? So for me, there's something quite interesting about the way in which archives at the moment are being not particularly our, our own, because I think our own are more problematic in, in, in a nice way, <laughs> making, you know, uh, using the, the hammer um, metaphor. Um, but, but there is something quite interesting about the question of collection at this point in time in an environmental uh, crisis, right? How, how much material is being collected? Where is it being collected? And why is it being collected, right? And for me, that, that becomes quite an issue. So my, my more recent work has been very interested, as Sunil has done through the years as well, and I have, uh, has been more interested in thinking through um, the, the, the kind of the diasporic lens of another space, right, of a family space, of Guyana, of the Caribbean, etc. And that material is of very little interest to England at this point in time, right? It's very little. The, the, the nation state does not want to know about Guyana. It certainly is not interested in knowing and having a critical engagement with oil that's coming out of Guyana at this point in time. So then the question is, who are you producing the work for? And in the end, it seems to me that that is quite an important thing for us to ask ourselves as artists, right? Why, you know, why at this point and how do we generate material that of course is sitting within an enormous amount of material? How do we then kind of navigate and uh, create narratives that are quite differently configured? So I guess in a way it's, um, it's, it's, it's always complicated by the institutional or the national agenda or the private owner's agenda. Um, and, our, and our work sits and our own desire kind of is mapped onto that in some way. So I guess for me, it's been about you know, why would this material be in, of interest to audiences, right? To which audiences, you know? I, I guess my, my, some of my material, and that's kind of an interesting one, is, is at the moment, at this moment in time, the, the like Goldust pieces on Guyana specifically, is kind of a vague interest in Guyana. It's vaguely interesting in a, a kind of a network of activists at this point in time who are thinking about extraction. Um, so I guess it's it goes back to you know how the how the material what you're generating as an artist and how you know, your responsibility your ethical relationship to an audience as well for me. And that's a whole different other discussion I suppose. But just open it up there. <laughs> Audience members. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for your presentations and for this discussion. This is Santiago <laughs> talking. Um, so you talked a lot about newer generations. And I can't help to th of thinking of how I'm part of uh, a newer generation of, of visual artists a uh, member also of representing, you know, diaspora, uh, Latino diaspora here in Canada, uh, queer community as well uh, with my practice. And I can't help to think how, obviously how important this type of conversation is, but how it wasn't really part of my uh, academic uh, upbringing and, and education. 
as an artist here in Canada, uh, in Ontario and, and in Montreal. So uh, it really makes me wonder how, you know, how important it is, but how uh, institutions are lacking also uh, having this content kind of embedded into curriculum or embedded into conversations beyond, let's say, um, uh, research networks like Elastic Spaces, like Crema, uh, uh, Westminster, or even here at Force Space. Um, and I was thinking uh, of the word map that you show Roshini uh, back in from the 80s, uh, these words that uh, were the themes, the thematics that were being explored in autograph uh, at the eight, in the 80s. And I was wondering what that would look like now, right? Especially thinking of these uh, social uh, cultural crisis that you were mentioning um, and how maybe if you can talk of how we can think of making the archive uh, maybe beyond an exhibition or activating this archive to not just be a, a type of uh, passive historical moment, but something that is, uh, something active, something that can be embedded into current conversations like we're doing right now. But uh, again, so it's embedded more into, into the institutions, into curriculums, into uh, the conversations that perhaps professors like yourselves are having with some of the students that, again, I'm talking from my experience that I didn't have this type of diversity growing up uh, in Canada with professors in, in my art education, in my undergrad or, or uh, much well, much less in my undergrad than, than the grads uh, program. So, yes. Just, I, I feel as if I've spoken quite a lot. I don't know if other people want to respond <laughs> to that. Uh, um, I mean, it's really great to hear Santiago. I mean, I, I think there's, there's something really, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of a denial going on certainly in the UK around what the university is teaching people, right? It seems to me that there, and and that's a that's a something that is is absolutely um, I'm finding in almost every institution encounter, whether that's an art institution or you know that there's a lag. The lag, it's like in architecture, you have you actually apply for planning permission and five years later you get a building, right? But the I but what we need now, it seems to me, is as is thought in the here and now, in the present moment, that actually are attending to the crisis that we're in at this point in time. And we haven't got that five-year lag anymore, right? So the idea of um of a, 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 an a, photo a photography degree or an art degree that is not actually necessarily, for example, encouraging social interaction and social activism and cultural activism, for example, learning how to work together to kind of bring a more collective and sustainable kind of making practice, um, which actually involves collections of people rather than individuals. All of those things to me are ethically how we might need to be thinking at this point in time. And I, and I think you're absolutely right. There is not, and, and to me, you know, queerness and issues around feminism and issues around race have really also kind of supported different types of practices, collectives, you know, <laughs> an association that the autograph had. So there are, examples to be found of ways in which we organize, ways in which we support to make work that actually has an ethical code to it that actually attends to an emergent emergency moment. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, I just don't think that that's necessarily being taught, but I think it's very, very urgent. And I think people like yourselves are absolutely at the forefront of being able to do that. I think it's a wonderful question, and um, I guess the challenge would be to the academics who are creating their course outlines. Like, what are they teaching? Um, I had the experience of, of trying to find, when I was teaching documentary um, classes, trying to find critical work about Canadian women documentary filmmakers. Uh, and it was very difficult because people who were involved, say, in film studies uh, were not writing 
those that I were not writing about Canadian women documentary filmmakers. So, you know, they're writing perhaps in general about film, but focusing on Canadian filmmakers, that wasn't happening. So I think somehow perhaps we, there's a challenge to be issued to the various academics about what it is they're teaching because they have such an incredible responsibility for shaping and putting uh, into the classroom, you know, these critical conversations and pulling from uh, the work of, of artists from, from all over the world. So I, I applaud that question. And I think we, we perhaps need to find ways to challenge uh, academic colleagues in the various disciplines to think about what indeed they are teaching. What is it that we're, um, you know, providing uh, the food? What are, what food are we providing for our students? I mean, there was conversation recently about after uh, the the murder of George Floyd and how all of these uh, curriculum online, you know, the the black black history syllabus, all of these things that were created. And then they disappeared and weren't really being used. You know, people wanted them, but then not actually using them within the classroom. So I, I think it's uh, it still remains um, a critical piece that is uh, very much missing. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your presentations. I actually, um, um, I'm not going to open it to a um, different uh, direction than my um, peer, Santiago, uh, asked, asked about. Um, other than being in contact with younger generations in terms of uh, sharing knowledge and history, I'm also, I have been, I mean, thinking a lot about um, the exhibitions that hold space for intergenerational uh, work. Nothing starts from scratch and every everything we uh, create builds on previous heritage, whether we know or not. And I, I mean, um, not that I have an answer, but I just wanted to ask you about if you have any ideas about and or um, insight on why there isn't a, so much of that happening. I feel a little bit overwhelmed, even as a young person li living in a time where youth is uh, more like youngness, let's, let's say, not youth. If youngness is um, uh, valued over like the wisdom of, um, and there's a hierarchy between the two. And I I wish I wish there wasn't that hierarchy because I think we need both and we need both of them to be in communication and sometimes I wonder I wish I was invited to an exhibition where I had um, exhibited with uh, artists who were there before me produced before me and I think that would redirect my work and I think it would uh, bring a new avenue because those are also like not just humans as we are in uh, communication but our works will get in communication and just um, I'm thinking about like what either maybe after talk listening you all maybe we need to just go do it ourselves like you did because if something doesn't exist maybe like you were explaining we need to go do it ourselves but uh, I think it's important when we come together to talk about also works not being shown together between generations and if you have any I'm all for that. You should definitely do it yourself. No one's going to do it for you. That's the number one thing we learned. <clears throat> uh, no one told us to do autograph. We just spontaneously, it kind of came about uh, because people put in time. Uh, so I think uh, from what you're saying, and in my experience, it's, I'd be more interested as an older person to be part of some process rather than just be an add-on to a show, um, meaning that I'd like to be part of curatorial discussions in the making up of the show, rather than arriving into a slot. Uh, <clears throat> and so I've been fortunate to be able to do that in India with uh, activist crews who were doing film festivals and so on, get into uh, heated arguments about what should be done 
at that moment, uh, what should be chosen to be shown and why and where and all of that. Uh, and that doesn't happen here very often, but I think people are trying to find ways. So uh, I am going this week going to attend a workshop uh, a whole day at York University, where there'll be 12 people from different institutions, <clears throat> older and younger, students and PhD students and uh, professors and all that, uh, just talking uh, like a peer group around the table. Uh, you know, not talking at the group, but with, but uh, to each other. Uh, and just, and just to add, I mean, it's really great to hear you say that. I mean, there are it's some interesting changes happening in uh, at the moment in in all kinds of ways. So, for example, Sylvia Thury, who is a young curator who then was trying to do the intergener was doing an intergenerational kind of exhibition. But again, it kind of points to asking your institutions to help you think through those pro those issues. Right? Why aren't you being encouraged to do exhibitions that actually are intergenerational? Why aren't you kind of thinking about you being beyond an artist and also have some say in the curation of a, of a, of a process, right? So there, for me, there is something about, you know, challenging those hierarchies that are very much in place in institutions currently and how you might disrupt that. What is it that you can bring, you can ask questions about um, and, and, and I guess that's what we're also going to be asking in relation to the archive, you know, where does the material, historical material sit in relation to contemporary and current work? How, what, what space does it occupy? How is it functioning in the, in the space? So for me, there is a, a kind of a way of art making and social and cultural practice that is absolutely up for being challenged in all kinds of ways, you know, and one of them is, you know, who gets, who gets to say who's going to be in the show, where is the show, you know, who is in it and how you might have a voice in that process in the same way that we tried to do in the 80s. And that's about autonomy and it's about independence and about having developing an independent autonomous voice that is not speaking to the agendas of our current institutions because they are not serving us very well, right? And we have to, we're trying to change them from the inside because we're the oldies kind of happen to be in those institutions, but actually those coming in and those outside can absolutely be asking those questions. Um, it's really crucial and it has to be done in a shorter time frame you know we you know we can't we can't be waiting around too much anymore so there's an urgency to it for me um so yes ask you know ask to curate a show an intergenerational show and produce the work in that way so that's, it would be great to see i i just wanted to intervene here and i've received permission to go over time and I'd like to ask Mitty and Sylvia to give last words, but I want to remind you to um, tune in to um, Maria Teresa Lorenz Shadow Girl, which will be shown 3 p.m. to 4.30 Eastern time on CFMDC TV. And it will, I put the uh, link in the chat. And then at 4.30, Maria Teresa and Mitty will be having a Q&A. And then tomorrow at noon Eastern, climate ch change in the forest, real, imaginary, and virtual. And Wednesday, a link to the screening of Mich Michelle Mohabir's Queer Coolitudes, uh, 3 p.m. to 4.30 Eastern time and 4.30 to 5 uh, Eastern time. Rashini and Michelle will be in a Q&A. So back over to Mitty and Sylvia for last words. And thank you everyone for today, but first their last words. Okay. okay. Sylvia and, and, uh, and Mitty. Sylvia, would you like to go or? Okay, am I unmuted? Yes. Well, thanks everyone for um, a very stimulating and fruitful conversation. I really learned a lot from Rashini and, and Sunil, your, your work. Uh, thank you for that work and thank you for your 
your diligence over so many years and Layla and Mitty as well, and all of the participants who, who came uh, at Concordia and online. And I, the one thing is um, in a diff different African cultures, there is this concept of the Sankofa, looking back and looking forward. And I think that that's something that is really important and has been important to me uh, to have what I call that long view, looking back and finding out the things that we need to bring along with us, uh, those things that we need to leave aside and how do we look forward. And I think the notion for me of, as well of the intergenerational conversation remains just so very vital and, and that we have to find those ways to make, to make that happen. I'll make one note, there's an ex exhibition right now at the Dalhousie Art Gallery curated by a good friend of mine, David Woods, and it's about, it's of African Nova Scotian quilts, the, the amazingly beautiful quilts that are on display there, and eventually it will travel across the country. One of the things that's happened in that ex exhibition is intergenerational work. There are young quilters uh, whose work sits beside quilters who have been quilting for many, many years. So, so that work is happening as we speak at the moment at the Dalhousie Art Gallery in Nova Scotia. So it is possible. It really is about the curatorial vision uh, and the, the ability of the galleries to recognize that they need to do that. So thanks all. Um, I echo Sylvia's comments about the panelists and about the participants of the panel. Um, I think Elastic uh, Space is, is such an excellent uh, uh, vehicle for these kinds of discussions to continue. Um, but I would really, really encourage people not to be afraid. Don't be afraid to question. Don't be afraid to question your institutions that you're studying in. You know, ask them the hard questions. Don't be afraid to argue because arguing is actually good. It makes you think. It makes you question your own values and your own positions. And when we argue, we also have to listen. And when those two things happen, I believe that things can happen and different directions can be found. So we live in a very kind of tight, polite climate. And we're sometimes so afraid to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or be uh, not inclusive enough. But, you know, don't be afraid to speak. Don't be afraid to question. And I would encourage everyone to continue to do that uh, because that to me is where change can happen. Wow, thank you. <laughs> So bye everyone, see you I hope at the screening, CFMDC and the Q&A after with uh, Maria, Teresa and uh, Midi. Bye. Okay. Bye bye, bye bye. Take, take good care, thanks so much for uh, being here. I'm just saying goodbye to the people on Zoom as well. Thanks so much for being in that space and those of you with us in the space, thanks for making the time to come in here and join us until uh, 3 p.m. for the next event, bye.